you know, people have asked me whether or not I believe in God, and I've answered in various ways. No, but I'm afraid he probably exists. That's, that's one answer. <laughs> Saga and lion's mane mushrooms. So it was grown with functional mushrooms, high altitude grown, hand picked, wet processed, carefully dried, slow roasted, nitro packed. It's a dark roast coffee. Beautiful. It's got a very smooth, kind of natural flavor to it. It's, it's, it's good. Now you guys see what happens when I get a little bit too excited about the weather. It turns bad. Or at least rel relatively bad. It's not too bad. But it's cold. We got this steady sort of wet snowy sleet. <laughs> um. Yeah, no, but I'm terrified he might exist. That that would be truthful answer to some degree, or that I act as if God exists, which I think is, I do my best to do that. But then there's a real stumbling block there because there's no limit to what would happen if you acted like God existed. Yeah, you know what I mean because I believe that that acting that out fully. I mean, maybe it's not reasonable to say to believers, you aren't sufficiently transformed for me to believe that you believe in God, or that you believe the story that you're telling me. You're not, you're not a sufficient, you're not, the way you live isn't sufficient testament to the truth. And people would certainly say that, let's say, about the Catholic Church, or at least the way that it's been portrayed, is that with all the sexual corruption, for example, it's like, really, really, you believe that the Son of God that, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and yet you act that way, and I'm supposed to buy your belief. Hmm. And, and it seems to me that the church is actually quite um, guilty on that account, because the attempts to clean up the mess have been rather half-hearted in my estimation. Yeah. And so I don't think people, uh, people don't manifest, Christians don't manifest this, and I'm including myself, I suppose, in that description, perhaps um, don't manifest the transformation of attitude that would enable that enables the outside observer to easily he, he included himself in the description of Christians that's interesting he hasn't done that before conclude that they believe yeah now the way the way to deal with that or the way to, to understand that is that it they do, but they do in a hierarchy. There's a, there's a hierarchy of manifestation of the transformation that God offers the world. And we kind of live in that hierarchy. And those above us hold us together, you would say. And so in the church, there's a testimony of the saints. There's There are stories. There are hundreds and hundreds of stories of people who live that out in their particular context to the limit of what it's possible to live in. And even today, there are there are saints, living saints, who, for example, like in the Orthodox tradition, we have this idea of what they call it the gift of tears, or the joyful sorrow of, of people who live in prayer with weeping, constant weeping. Uh, and it's this kind of strange mix of joy and, uh, and sadness, which, they, which kind of overwhelms them, and they live in that joy and sadness nonstop, and they pray you know, without end. And so that exists, but then we, and this, that's one of the reasons why, that's kind of one of the reasons why when I talk about this idea of attention, like it manifests itself in the, in the church as well, is that... See, I, I understand Jordan Peterson's criticism of the church. It seems to me that 
especially in Nietzsche's criticism of the church, he gets so distracted with criticizing um, the populace, the people who worship Christ, and winds up uh, he ends up undermining himself because he he ignores all of the good. That's one of the things I I, I always hate when ever uh, you know at jobs or in family or or where, wherever. I hate when I do good things and then I do a, a wrong thing, maybe one wrong thing, and the wrong thing is what gets the most attraction and attention. That is is just seems so full of injustice, so wrong. It just seems so um, it un. Un unfair. I don't like using that word, but um, I'll take my hat off. You can't ignore the good. The question would be, why are you focusing purely on on the bad? The Bible does not say that Christians will be perfect. The Bible does not say that anyone will be perfect except for God. The Bible doesn't say that Christians will not stumble. The Bible doesn't say that human beings will not stumble. It simply says that in this process of, of, of building ourselves, of working our way towards the kingdom of God, we, we are to tr try to be like Christ. And the reason he came down and became like us in our flesh, you know, in our bones and everything, and, and experienced our pain in a very visceral, visceral and, and hor horrible way. The reason he came down like that is so that we could experience it, see, see that he had experienced those things just like us, that he had felt all of the same emotions, had, had all of the same urges, had all, all of the same sensory experiences, especially as a child, you know, memories and everything, and attachments, but yet he was perfect, so he's an ideal to strive for. No one ever said that the church would not stumble, and I, I get that these people think that, <coughs> these people think that the church is bad because it does bad things. Well, what would you like to replace it with? Exactly. That would be my point. Fire right back at you. Deflect back. Or re reflect back. Not deflect. Do you think if you replaced it with a pagan uh, form of government, a, a pagan church, do you think that they wouldn't hurt people? Do you think that they wouldn't develop corruption? Do you think that they wouldn't discriminate? Do you think that they wouldn't use their power as a bludgeon against the lowest class? Do you think that they wouldn't take advantage of that? Of course they would. Of course they would. We know that. We know that deeply. It's built in it's built into our evolution to conquer one another. It's why it's it's why we fight. It's why we are territorial. But it's not that wretchedness, that sin, that what, what I was just talking about, the conquering, the fighting, the killing, the sexual sins. It's not that that we're supposed to focus on. That's, that's a given until the world ends or Christ comes back. That's a given. We are, we are to expect that. What we're supposed to focus on is Christ. And these people that develop this critical spirit, that is, that is the spirit of the Antichrist and of Satan. And maybe they should look in the mirror to see if they have truly developed themselves enough. Look in the mirror to see if they are perfect. Because when I look around and when I look at 
a lot of these atheist, agnostic, uh, an anti-theist types, I see people who are not just deeply flawed, I see people who are bitter, resentful, hateful. They've got all this stored up inside. I was kind of like that at one point. I was, I was like that five, six years ago. And, uh, it, it doesn't lead to anything good, I can tell you that. So, you often say, and I understand it, when you say something like, you know, I act as if God exists, or, you know, I, I'm afraid to say that God exists. Uh, and I think it's because you, you think, or you tend to think that the moral weight, like, of that is so strong that you would you would crumble under it, that you would just be crushed under it. And and I, I think believe that, that, that and I think that that's I think that I, I I understand that. But the first thing that to act as if God exists, let's say it this way, to act as, as if God exists, the first thing that it asks of you is not a moral action. The first thing that it ask, asks, asks of you is attention. That's why to act as if God exists is first of all to worship. Like that's, and, it, and I know people are gonna hear this. Well, then, say, I okay. have a, then I have a terrible problem with that too at the moment <laughs> because I'm in so much pain. Like one of the things that one of these theologians discussed the idea of, and sorry, I want to let you get back to your point, but he discussed the idea of the yoke of Christ being light, and that there was joy in it, and um, and there's a paradox there, obviously, because it's it's also a take up your cross and follow me sort of thing. But um, the fact that I've been living in constant pain makes the idea of joy seem um, cruel, I would say. And so, and I have no idea how to reconcile myself to that. I mean, I've reconciled myself to that by staying alive, despite it, you know. Um, although, by staying alive despite it, but there's very little worship. And it doesn't mean I'm not appreciative of what I have. I'm, I'm not only am I appreciative of what I have, I do everything I can to remind myself of it all the time. And so does my wife. I mean, she's changed quite a bit as a consequence of her struggle with cancer, you know, has become much more overtly religious, I would say, and, you know, we say grace before our meal in the evening, and it's a very serious enterprise, and it always centers around gratitude, you know, for, well, for, for the ridiculous volume of blessings that have been showered down upon us, at a volume that... Well... Think. Uh, I'm I'm too young to comment on anything that he's gone through or anything his wife has gone through. But I think I have I have suffered. Um, I know what it's like. I've never come close to dying. I don't think. But here's the thing. I think. Peterson is not willing to take that final step of faith, yet he might be in the future. In order to see Christ as fully manifest as, as the Son of God. I think one of the things holding him back from taking that step of faith is his own pain and the hypocrisy of the church, the hypocrisy of Christian people, because Christian people, as we know, are absolutely hypocrites. Right? I I am one of those hypocrites. Um. But that's the, that's the thing about joining the the body of um, of anybody. You know, jo joining anybody, not even just a body of, of believers, but that's that's just part of being a family. You know, just a just your 
nuclear family, your mother, your father, sister, brother, you love each other as one, as a whole, there's a wholeness in the body, just like there's a wholeness in the body of Christ. It's a lesser wholeness, although it's, it's God intended us to have families and it's a beautiful thing. It is a lesser form of, of wholeness and they are lesser relationships than, than that of the relationship of uh, the individual to to God. We love each other, but we also fight with each other, and we also recognize that we're very imperfect and we're very full of hypocrisy. And we had to call each other out on our on our horse shift from time to time. How is it any different? So you're gonna say, well, Dad is a hypocrite. You know, just say, just says. As an, as an argument, as a hypothetical. Dad, he's such a hypocrite. He's done all these things. He's blah, 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 and he hasn't corrected all, all of them. Does that mean you should just not acknowledge that he's your father? The answer is no. He's still your father. And he always will be. And... That's all I have to say. I'm done. It's really I've got at a volume like a that's really quite incomprehensible. But despite that, um, well, let despite that, I'm struggling with this because I don't know how to reconcile myself to the to the fact of constant pain. Yeah. I'm just gonna say one more thing. Jordan Peterson's main message has been, life is suffering. How do you handle that suffering? I'm not even going to comment on that. I'm not even going to comment. That's his, that's his whole, that's, that's the foundation of, that's what he's been preaching, is that life is suffering. You, you just, it is. You have to acknowledge it. All right. And I don't, I feel that it's unjust, which is halfway to being resentful, which yeah. is not a good outcome. Not a good outcome. That's not a good outcome. And he's also preached against resentfulness. He's spoken against resentfulness. Because honestly, I think, <clears throat> I think the antidote to Jordan Peterson's chaos is within his own book. No one else can help him. He can help him by by turning to God in a time of crisis. That's, I don't I don't know how else. I don't know if, if I would do anything. I, I I that's what I would do. That's what I always try to do. No, I I. I agree, and it, I can't speak, like, I can't, I don't know how to speak to that because I don't necessarily don't have that experience. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't have that, I don't live with constant pain, and so I don't know what that would do to me. Probably, probably one of the reasons why it might ruin me, you know, and so, um, it's very difficult to answer that. I think that the answer, like the answer has been the cross, like that's been the answer. It's an easy, maybe it may be easy for me to just say it that way, uh, but that's always been the answer of, of Christianity, which is that, that God went to, to the cross and that God went down into death and, and plunged down into death and there are, that there are mysteries hidden and they're maybe they're very well hidden, but there are mysteries hidden in that in that depth. Um, but uh, it's not. I don't think it's my job to uh, to to moralize to you at this at this particular moment. Yeah. Nor it is. Nor is it anyone else's job. And I wasn't trying to moralize. See, that's that's the thing. We all have our choice. It matters which choice we make. It matters what we choose. It matters the decisions that we make. So I think Jordan Peterson is definitely... Um, he seems like he's struggling. He seems like he's going through a lot. He seems like he's gone through more than what 
the average person will go through in their life because he's not your average person but I think he understands the, the suffering aspect of it I think he understands better than most and I think he's just wrestling right now that's what I think he's doing